ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا ما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for each and every blessing that he has bestowed upon us. We praise Allah azza wa jal for the blessings that we have recognized and can acknowledge and for the blessings that are hidden and we cannot even acknowledge them because they are hidden. And we thank Allah azza wa jal for having guided us to this beautiful faith and we would not have been guided had it not been for his guidance. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and all of our loved ones during this very uh, difficult and trying uh, times and to protect us and our loved ones from the plague. And we ask Allah that those that have passed on uh, and how many, many are they in the last few weeks and months? Uh, those that have passed on, we ask Allah for their maghfirah and their forgiveness and that their ranks are exalted and their graves are made a vast place. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, let us begin our Q&A for today. Uh, so I'm going to begin uh, on a spiritual question. We have been uh, concentrating on a lot in the fiqh stuff, which is only understandable. But uh, once in a while, it's good to, um, you know, uh, bring about uh, some of the core values because... We do have to realize, brothers and sisters, that our religion is more than just laws and haram and halal and wajib. It's more than this. And no doubt there is the, the, the reality of laws and it's there, it's important, but there's always an inner core of spirituality as well. So our first question today uh, comes from brother one Yahya from Malaysia, mashallah tabarakallah. And he says that uh, we're supposed to have a pure heart, qalb salim. And we're supposed to emulate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His question is, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his heart was cleansed and his heart was purified in a supernatural manner. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala fortified it with Iman. So given that we are expected to have the Qalb Salim and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Qalb is our role model obviously, how can we possibly follow him when he has reached a level that we can never expect to reach. Now, uh, this is a, a very beautiful uh, question, and it is a question that uh, uh, you can sense, inshallah ta'ala, that our brother has a sincere love, and he's worried that he's not gonna get to that status or that station, because obviously our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is who he is, and where are we in this regard? And he mentions the issue of qalb salim, and that's a very, a deep and profound topic. And the topic of Qalbun Salim, I actually have given a number of khutbas and talks, you can find it online. But just to summarize that, uh, what our brother is referencing is that the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said in the Quran that uh, on the day of judgment, uh, on that day, that يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ that neither wealth nor money will benefit anybody the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, made an exception and he said that uh, except for the one who came in front of Allah with a pure heart, qalb salim, with a pure heart. And Allah mentions the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and praises him when Allah says, إِذْ جَاءَ رَبَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Ibrahim السلام, came to Allah with a qalbun salim. Now, of course, the term qalb, uh, it is a reference to the spiritual heart. It is not a reference to the physical pulsating heart. This is a physical organ. When the Quran mentions qalb, when the Prophet mentions qalb, there is a, a spiritual inner reality to our existence. We will never understand it. It's not something that is located in a particular place and time, but it is located inside of us. And the Arabic word qalb actually means, technically, it means that which is inside, right? Qalaba, it means that which is inside. Qalaba is that which is inside. Also, by the way, the term qalaba also indicates uh, fluttering, okay? It indicates vacillation. It indicates turning round. And so, our heart is called qalb because number one, it is inside of us, right? Literally and spiritually. And number two, because the qalb keeps on changing. 
right? One day you have the highest level of courage, the next day <laughs> you're scared. One day you have himma and taqa and strength, the next day you just want to give up, okay? One day your iman is so strong, the next day, you know, it's not uh, like that, you know? One day you hate somebody, the next day you will love that person. So, qalb is called qalb because it constantly changes. And that is why our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua to Allah that Allahumma thabbit qulubana, that O oh Allah, make our hearts firm upon your worship. If our hearts change in love and hate and whatnot, you know, in this world and whatnot, okay, but it should not change when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should be firm in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course the word uh, salim, it means it's from the same root as Islam, and it means the absence of evil, right? Some have translated it as peace, but in reality, Salim means the heart that has no evil in it. And the Qalbun Salim, it is called Qalb Salim because number one, it does not have the love of any God besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, it does not have any factors in it that prevents the person from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the doubts that might exist in the heart of the munafiq or following one's desires, you know, lustfully, for example, right? This is not going to be qalbun salim because there are people that believe in Allah but they have impediments in the worship of Allah. Qalbun Salim, he believes in Allah and none but Allah as a Lord. And then there are no impediments in the worship of Allah. And then point number three, that there's no animosity and no hatred for anybody else in this world. You have a pure heart. Qalbun Salim is that to the best of your ability, you do not have jealousy to any fellow believer. You do not have any hatred. You do not have any uh, uh, arrogance towards any other makhluq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're able to master these three things, then Qalbun Salim has been uh, reached. And our brother is saying that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has reached a level of Qalbun Salim that we cannot reach. And this is obvious, nobody can possibly deny this. And that is why he is our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, Allah says in the Quran that one of the reasons why he is so perfect and so chosen is that the Quran has come to his Qalb, right? نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنذِرِينَ the Holy Spirit or the trustworthy angel has come down with the Quran upon your qalb. So our dear brother in Islam is, is asking a legitimate question. How can we possibly compare my qalb and your qalb to the qalb that the Allah chose the Quran to come down and be preserved in, right? That نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنذِرِينَ بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍّ مُبِينٍ In pure Arabic, Allah has revealed the Quran to the heart of the messenger. And our brother is saying, how can we compete with that? And the response, dear brother in Islam, the goal is not competition. The goal is not to even get to that level because we know ilm al yaqeen nobody can get to that level. But the goal is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that guiding light, He revealed that nur, He revealed that guidance, and He revealed the messenger to be the perfect role model so that we have something to look up to. We know we're not gonna get to that exact same level, and that's not the goal. The goal is we keep that level or that uh, maqam and that height in our eyes and we keep that bar which is raised so high, we keep it in our sights all the time and we try our best in every aspect of our life. We try our best to come as close to the goal as possible with the realization we will never actually achieve it. You see, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is called a Qudwatun Hasana. And a Qudwatun Hasana literally means a good role model, a perfect role model. Allah did not reveal uh, the Quran uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that all of us are going to be exactly like him. Allah revealed it to him so that all of us can attempt to emulate him, so that we can take him as Qudwatun Hasana. And of course he was aided miraculously because he is the Prophet of Allah. He is the chosen, he is the Mustafa. And what does Mustafa mean? Inna Allah Adama wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al Allah has chosen 
chosen specific people. Allah has chosen. Istafa means to take apart and to purify. So Allah has chosen certain prophets and certain families. The family of Ibrahim has been chosen and the family of Imran has been chosen and specific people in that lineage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised their ranks and purified them. And therefore our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was indeed given a miracle. And of the miracles he was given, many miracles, of the miracles he was given is that as a child, his heart was opened up and his heart was cleansed miraculously. And of course, these reports uh, are in uh, uh, the uh, Sira books of Ibn Hisham and Ishaq, and the Quran references it as well. Alam nashrah laka sadrak is referencing here that the Prophet's heart was purified in zamzam with zamzam water uh, in a canister of gold, purified, and any evil that was in it, it was uh, taken out. And of course, we actually believe that this was done twice. This this uh, spiritual operation. It was done twice. Firstly, when he was a child, and then secondly, on the night of Isra and Miraj, he was fortified once again. And of course, this is something we expect uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, honor our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and fortify his iman and give him a qalbun salim. And even uh, in the hadith of Bukhari as well, that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned that every one of us has an evil shaitan that's trying to misguide us. And that shaitan has been with us since we were born. And Aisha said that, O Messenger of Allah, even you? And he said, yes, even me, but Allah has helped me that my qareen has converted to Islam and he only commands good things, right? This is a divine thing, of course. You know, we expect our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be blessed in this uh, regard. So my dear brother in Islam, I sense your love for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I sense your fear at being, uh, you know, uh, uh, distant from him. But I can only assure you uh, with the assurance that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to a man that came to him and said, O Messenger of Allah, I don't have, you know, that much, you know, sadaqah and I don't have that much, you know, uh, uh, salah and siyam, but I have a love for Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger. My heart has love for Allah and His Messenger. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you shall be with those whom you love. You shall be with those whom you love. So the goal is not to uh, to, re to ever try to achieve that exact level. The goal is to keep on striving. And in al amalu bin niyat, Allah will see your effort and your dedication. This is the beauty of our faith, dear brother in Islam. Listen to this carefully. Every single boss or friend or life partner or colleague or human being will judge you by the final product. Nobody judges by the efforts you put in. You know, as a professor, it does, nobody cares as a professor. Your professor doesn't care how many hours you studied. He wants to see the result on the exam. If it so happened you didn't study at all and you just happen to know the answers and you ace it and there are others that studied the whole semester and for whatever reason the, the, the question was difficult and they weren't able to answer. Now, you're not rewarded by effort in this world, but in the eyes of Allah you are rewarded by effort. You're rewarded by dedication, by sincerity. Therefore, dear brother in Islam, put in the effort, be sincere, do each and every good deed, and in particular, in particular of the deeds that you should do to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I will mention two things that are explicitly mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, one of the servants of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Prophet asked him, what do you want in, you know, for me to give you? And the servant was smart. He didn't say any money, any horse. He said, I want to be with you in Jannah, O Messenger of Allah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَأَعِنِّي عَلَى نَفْسِكَ بِكَثْرَةِ السُّجُودِ Help me to help you in this cause by lots of sajdas. So our dear brother wants to be close to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way to do that is number one, extra sajdas. Lots of nafil salah, make sure you're praying the regular fard, tahajjud prayers, nafil salah, your, your sunnah, the ratiba, make sure that that is done. And number two, our Prophet explicitly said in the hadith, أَقْرَبُكُمْ مِنِّي مَنْزِلًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ That the closest of you to me in my manzil, the closest, you're not going to get to that manzil, but the closest to you are who? أَحَاسِنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقًا The best of you in manners. So monitor your manners, control your anger, good speak good words. 
Do not get angry at people. Don't be sarcastic and putting people down. Uh, give better than what people expect and expect from others less than what is due unto you. And always be the better of the two in any situation. These are the two things and there are more, but of course time is limited. You're asking about trying to achieve, you know, as close proximity as possible. That will be done by lots of sajdas and by good akhlaq. And so to respond to your question, dear brother in Islam, aim and strive and put in the effort and realize the goal is not to, with your actions, get to that level that will never happen. The goal is that Allah will see your sincerity, Allah will see your efforts, and Allah will reward you to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He blesses us to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Day of Judgment and in Jannat al Firdaus al A'la. Our next uh, um, uh, question uh, is from Brother Arshad. Our next question is from Brother Arshad and he asks that um, he has noticed that people pray witr in different manners and uh, he is now confused. He says that he is coming from a particular background. Now he has come to this country and uh, in Taraweeh and in other uh, situations, he has seen people are praying witr in different manners. So he's asking, you know, what is to be done in this regard? The response, my dear brother in Islam, is that uh, the witr is one of those prayers in which pretty much all of the madhahib have, you know, slightly different answers. And so whichever madhab that you uh, were upon, you may choose that madhab and follow it, no problem. It is a very, very, uh, you know, trivial matter, whichever of the positions you follow. Uh, inshallah, they're all telling you to pray witr and they're all wanting you to, to do the, the prayer. The differences are in the, 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 the minor or the, the minutia, if you like. And the, the witr prayer is, of course, called witr because the term witr means odd and the witr prayer is an odd prayer it's always an odd number of raka'at so three raka'at is the default uh, position of most of the madhabs and it is uh, uh, the Hanafi madhab uh, specifies three in particular and it's an odd uh, number and uh, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam strongly commanded the people or strongly uh, suggested, depending on how you want to interpret it, uh, the people to pray witr. In the famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Huraira radiallahu an said that my friend, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, commanded me with three things. He strongly, wasla means to put it very strongly. Three things, number one, to fast three days of every month, Number two, to pray two raka'ah uh, at Salat al-Duha, which is basically between uh, Fajr, after an hour after Fajr until Salat al-Duhr. And number three, and to pray witr before I go to sleep. So uh, the Prophet wanted Abu Huraira to reach a high level. And he's putting on Abu Huraira certain, uh, you know, extra things that he should do. And so fasting three days of every month, praying uh, Salat al-Duha, also called uh, uh, Ishraq prayer, uh, which is, as we said, uh, the early uh, Sunnah prayer uh, after uh, the sun rises uh, until Salat al-Duhr. And then number three, to pray Witr before I go to sleep. Uh, meaning that in case you are not waking up for tahajjud, you pray witr before you go to uh, sleep. And uh, it is reported in Abu Dawood that Ali radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said, O people of the Quran, pray witr because Allah Azza wa Jal Himself is witr, meaning one, and He loves the witr, meaning the witr prayer, uh, and He loves witr. So, this hadith saying, O people of the Quran, some have said that, O people of the Quran means, O Muslims, because we all believe in the Quran. And others have said that the Prophet ﷺ is especially saying to those who have memorized the Qur'an, that those who have memorized the Qur'an in particular, they should not spend the whole night asleep. Uh, they should pray uh, witr uh, prayer uh, and pray some extra prayers above and beyond the five uh, prayers. And uh, in another hadith reported in Muslim Muhammad, that uh, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an, he gave a, uh, a khutbah. Uh, on the day of Jumu'ah and public. And he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, so he's giving the khutbah, and in the khutbah he's telling all of the people there what he heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah has added a prayer 
for all of you to pray, and it is the prayer of Witr. And so pray the Witr between Salat al Isha until Salat al Fajr. This is a hadith reported in Muslim Imam Ahmad. Allah has added a prayer for you, so pray it between Isha and Fajr. Now, these hadith um, all mention some of the blessings of Witr, and there are other hadith as well. And based on these hadith, and also based upon the Hanafi school's categorization of actions, uh, pause here, footnote, I mentioned in another Q&A many, many, you know, many, uh, many months ago, I think almost a year and a half ago, that the Hanafis, they have uh, seven categorizations of all actions, and uh, the other madhab have five categorizations. So the Hanafis take uh, the fard and the wajib, and they make it two different things. And they take, you know, um, makru, and they say uh, makru uh, tanzimi and makru tahrimi. And so what they have basically is two categories of obligatory and two categories of sin. Whereas the rest of the schools have one category of obligatory and one category of sin. And therefore based on that, so they say fard and wajib is the same. Whereas for the Hanafis, fard is higher than the wajib. And the same goes for the other side of the spectrum. So the Hanafis say the five salawat are fard and the witr is wajib. Meaning if you do not pray witr, you are sinful in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they have that category that wajib is uh, something that it is obligatory to do, but let's just be simplistic, not to the level of the uh, fard. The other three schools, they don't have that distinction. And they simply have strongly encouraged and obligatory. And based on this categorization, witr cannot come under obligatory. And so the other three schools basically have it at the very, very highest level of strongly encouraged. In other words, right underneath obligatory, they would have Salat al-Witr. Okay, so that if you don't pray witr according to the other three schools, you know, Allah's not gonna you know, punish you in Jahannam for not praying witr, but you're really falling short. And it's the most important of all of the Sunan uh, prayers. All of the non-wajib prayers, the three madhabs say, it is the strongest level. So uh, this is in terms of its, uh, its, uh, its nature, is it obligatory or is it not? And uh, each of the school has its you know, um, uh, evidences to do so. And in the end of the day, you know, I think yani, as Imam Ahmed and others said that, you know, how can a Muslim not pray witr? You know, I mean, he, he considered the one who doesn't pray witr as somebody whose testimony should not be accepted in a court of law, for example. Like, he is such a, uh, according to him, that, that, that paradigm, like how can he be trusted if he's going to be so lazy as to not even pray witr, you know, uh, in the end of the night. And so let's not really get involved whether it's obligatory or not. Let's just try to pray witr because it is definitely uh, something that the Prophet strongly, strongly, strongly encouraged us to pray. And his own action, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never ever stopped praying witr. Even when he was traveling, he would pray witr. When he was traveling, he would not pray the other uh, regular you know, sunan of the Dhuhr and Maghrib and, uh, uh, and um, after Isha, but he would pray Witr and he would pray the two rak'ahs before Fajr. These are the two that he would pray when he is uh, traveling. So let us make sure that we pray our uh, Witr. Now that's the first issue. The second issue, what is the timing of Witr? Here we have basically no controversy at all amongst the scholars that the timing of Witr is any time after you pray uh, Salat al-Isha, until the crack before the time of Fajr, basically, right? Until the, uh, the dawn basically breaks, okay? Not the sunrise, but the dawn breaking, i.e. that line that comes and signifies uh, the, the, the time of Fajr. So, Witr is from after Isha, whenever you pray Isha, after that, until the timing of Fajr, it can be prayed at any time. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a famous hadith in Sahih Muslim and others, that whoever is worried that he's not gonna pray witr at the end of the night, then let him pray witr in the beginning of the night. And whoever thinks that he can pray at the end, let him pray at the end of the night because the prayer at the end of the night is going to be witnessed by the angels and that is more blessed and hadith. So. This hadith tells us then that the ideal timing for witr is pre-fajr. And this leads us to our next point, and that is that the concept of witr is linked to, but not necessarily attached to, the concept of tahajjud, okay? So witr could imply 
all of tahajjud and you can call all of tahajjud witr because in the end of the day you will pray an odd number of rakat so you will pray eight you know plus three that is 11 that's like all of your tahajjud therefore sometimes when the term witr is used in the hadith it implies all of the tahajjud and the three rakats at the end and sometimes it only uh, uh, applies to that very last you know uh, three uh, rakah and so for example in the hadith of abu huraira which he's in which he said that my friend advised me to pray witr before i go to sleep what he means here is salat tahajjud and what he means here is that you know, so let's give an example that let's suppose that Isha is at 8.30 p.m. and you go to sleep at 11 p.m. and for whatever reason, you know, you're not, you don't w wake up for tahajjud, you wake up for Salat al-Fajr. So what Abu Huraira is saying is that I would pray Isha at 8.30, you know, then whatever needs to be done, then before 11 o'clock, before going to sleep, I will pray the whole tahajjud and then go to sleep. Okay, so Abu Huraira, because he was busy with hadith, because he was, you know, for a period of his life, he was very, you know, engrossed in memorizing and whatnot. So he would pray tahajjud before going to sleep, and that is a permissible time for tahajjud. And he called witr uh, tahajjud. Now, uh, most of us, when we use the term witr, what we mean by it is the specific, you know, three raka'at only. And that's fine, nothing wrong with that uh, terminology. But most of us want to use the term witr, that is what we mean. Now, the Hanafis, as we said, they said that uh, the three witr prayer is going to be just like Salat al-Maghrib, that you will pray uh, three raka'at, you will sit down in the second raka'at, you will say the tashahud, and then you will stand up, and then you will sit down in the third raka'at, and uh, you will then uh, have one taslim at the end, okay? So, for the Hanafi uh, uh, madhab, Maghrib and Witr resemble one another. As well, the Hanafis are the strictest out of all of the schools when it comes to Qunut. A lot of the Hanafi brethren are, are not aware of this, that the other three madhahib uh, do not have the qunut as such a, a necessary part of witr. Uh, some of them say it is allowed or, or mustahab, uh, but the, and in practice, as we're going to come to, uh, basically none of the other madhahibs in practice, i.e. the followers of those madhahib, generally speaking, they don't do qunut in uh, witr. But the Hanafis, as we're all aware, those of us that are from Hanafi background, the Hanafis associate witr with qunut. And for the other schools, Qunut is a separate dua and it is not uh, necessarily linked with witr to the level of the Hanafis. The Hanbalis and the Shafi'is, they allow the witr, uh, in the, sorry, they allow the Qunut in the witr. As I said, uh, the Shafi'is and the Hanbalis, they allow, and in fact the Hanbalis say it is encouraged even, but they do not make it something that is basically an integral part. And in practice, most of the followers of the Shafi'i school and most of the followers of the Hanbali school, in practice, they do not do uh, witr because the, the madhab is not you know, that strict upon it. It is something allowed if you want to do it, go ahead and, and do it. Um, and the, the Hanafi school is the strictest when it comes to the dua of the witr. And uh, there's a special dua, they call it dua al-qunut as, uh, as uh, we know, and it is done before the last uh, ruku'. Now, other madhabs are, um, there's also reports within the Hanbali Madhab as well. They say that the witr uh, should only have the qunut in the very last days of Ramadan. And this is a report also from the Maliki Madhab as well, that the qunut, the prayer, the dua should be associated with the witr only in the month of Ramadan and some even add in the last half of Ramadan, like the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So these are all positions about the qunut vis-a-vis uh, -vis the witr. All of them are, uh, you know, uh, uh, narrated and permissible. As well, there is quite a lot of, you know, difference of opinion about the procedure of praying witr. I said that the Hanafis pray three rak'ah continuously with one taslim. The Maliki school, uh, they said that it is better to pray two raka'ah, then you make a taslim, then you stand up and pray one raka'ah on its own. Okay, so for the Maliki school, they break the three raka'ah into two halves. And they base this on a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray uh, witr uh, when in my room, in my hujra, in my uh, chambers or, or compartment, and I was in the house at that time, and he would separate between the two raka'ah 
and the witr, and I would hear the taslim between the two of them. So they use that uh, narration over there. And uh, the other uh, evidence that they have is a hadith reported in Dar al-Qutni and the Mustadrak of al-Hakim that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that لا توتروا بثلاث تشبه المغربة Do not perform the witr with three raka'ah or else it will look like Salat al-Maghrib, okay? So this hadith has been interpreted by uh, the other uh, uh, schools to basically say that, and especially the Maliki school, to say that the two raka'ah should be separated with the taslim, and then you stand up and you pray one raka'ah. The Maliki school did not associate qunut with witr. For them, witr is simply the odd uh, number, and they also allowed, even though they didn't encourage, they allowed one raka'ah. If you're going to be, you know, not want to pray the two raka'ah and just pray one raka'ah, it will still be uh, witr. Uh, the Shafi'i school, they said that the three uh, raka'ah is the minimum of perfection and you can pray more. So the Shafi'i said with it is five and seven and nine, no problem. And they said, yeah, if you really want to, we'll allow you to pray one, but that's like in makru, you really shouldn't pray only one. Three is the minimum of perfection, and it's even better to pray more than that, because again, for them, the concept of witr and tahajjud is kind of combined up. And so when you're praying like witr, it is kind of sort of a tahajjud, you might as well make it, you know, uh, five or seven or uh, nine. And for the Shafi'is, they said that uh, you pray all three raka'ah, all three raka'ah uh, continuously without sitting down in the second raka'ah. This is the uh, preferred position. And some said you pray two raka'ah and then you do taslim and then you do one raka'ah. So the Shafi'i madhab uh, did not want to resemble uh, the Maghrib prayer based on the hadith that they have. And so they wanted to go a different route. And they said you either pray three continuously without sitting down in the second. Number one, number two, you get back up, and then number three, then you make the uh, taslim. And of course, uh, both the Shafi'is and the Hanbalis, they also said that it is preferred to recite Surat Al-A'la in the first uh, uh, rak'ah, and then Surat Al-Kafirun uh, in the uh, last, uh, in the last, in the second rak'ah, and then Falaq uh, and Ikhlas and Nas. Sorry, Ikhlas and Falaq and Nas in the third rak'ah. Also, the Shafi'is were the madhab that said. Qunud should only be done in the last part of Ramadan during Witr and not throughout the year. In fact, the Shafi'i school has Dua Al-Qunud in Fajr Salah, by the way, and that's why all of the, the Arab brothers from Jordan and from Egypt and whatnot, they're aware of this, that the Shafi'i school prays Qunud in Fajr. And the Hanafi school in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Qunud is done in Witr. Uh, and uh, in the Hanbali school, in practice, in theory, it is also in with it is encouraged, but in practice, uh, they really don't do qunut except at times of, you know, an, um, uh, uh, calamities when they will uh, do that. So this is the Shafi'i school. Uh, the Hanbali school, they said that uh, it should also be done in three, uh, and to do less than three is allowed, but it is not something that should be encouraged. You can pray one, but it is makru, yet it is also accepted. And they also encourage to pray two, uh, plus one, uh, uh, and they also allowed the, uh, the the Hanafi way of doing it as well. So the, the Hanbali Madhab as usual has plenty of uh, positions about this, and they said that uh, Qunut is uh, encouraged to do, but as I said in practice, they did not actually do the Dua Al-Qunut. Also, by the way, for most of the Hanbalis, the Qunut is done after the Ruku', whereas for, for the Hanafis, the Qunut is done before the Ruku'. Okay. All of this was a quick, you know, uh, kaleidoscope uh, to explain to you that all of these positions have been narrated. In the end of the day, dear brother in Islam, uh, don't worry about the other schools. You have heard your particular school. Most likely, I'm assuming you're from the Hanafi background. No problem, then you pray the Hanafi procedure. These are things that, very trivial issues, whether you pray two and then taslim and then one, or you pray th three, or you do it, uh, the khunut, uh, before the ruku, after the ruku, or you don't do it at all if you're Maliki and Shafi'i, no problem. Whatever is done, these are all trivial things. The main point is that we pray Salat al-Witr, and that insha'Allah ta'ala, we strive to follow uh, the sunnah of the Prophet in this regard because we know that witr is one of the most encouraging of all of the sunnah prayers. Our next uh, question. 
Our next question we have uh, Brother Ibrahim from Myanmar. MashaAllah Tabarakal is very happy to receive this email. I did not know we have uh, viewers watching from Myanmar, which is the technically correct term for, for Burma. Uh, we ask Allah to facilitate and make it easy for all of our Muslim brothers and sisters in Burma and Myanmar. Uh, as we know, they're going through a lot of, of issues. Uh, Brother Ibrahim uh, emails a very, very um, beautiful question. And it was so moving, uh, I thought I would just read um, all of it, that all of these questions are related to charity. Brother Ibrahim says that, when we give sadaqah, must we verbalize the intention? And there are many types of sadaqah. There's fidya, there's kafara, there's salah, there's sadaqah, there's zakah. Which of them is the most beneficial? And he says, when I give, is money better or food better? Or how about helping somebody out? And he also asks, what are the additional steps we can take to derive the most benefit out of charity? And then he asks the final question is that, when we give charity, what should our intentions be? Can we intend that we want something of this world as well from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or must we intend only for the next uh, uh, and it would be problematic to give something for this world as well, i.e. what he means by this is that what if I give charity and I want to uh, you know, protect myself from evil? What if I give charity and I want to cure a sick one? What if I give charity and I want more wealth? Is that going to harm the purity of the intention? So all of these questions, uh, mashallah tabarakallah, deal with the reality of charity and uh, how to maximize this, uh, the impact of charity. And uh, I want to just point out that mashallah tabarakallah, our brother Ibrahim is really thinking deeply about this issue. And you can tell he's like deconstructing every single aspect he wants to, and he's eager to gain the maximum reward. And for me, inshallah, this demonstrates, inshallah ta'ala, a good heart, and it demonstrates that indeed our brother is upon uh, you know, the right path to get the maximum reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the specific questions he's asking. So he says that, must we verbalize the intention? And the response is that the verbalization of intentions, uh, it is something that generally speaking, uh, the sunnah has not come with. The only time that the sunnah has come with verbalizing the intentions is when we go for hajj. When we go for hajj, we say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ out loud. And uh, we make dua to Allah that, oh Allah, make this hajj or umrah, both of them are the same in terms of verbalizing, make this a hajj or an umrah uh, in which there is no showing off, in which we are doing this for your sake. Uh, and uh, we, we say that, oh Allah, I am intending to do hajj. O oh Allah, this is an umrah for your sake. O oh Allah, this is tamattu' or ifrad or qiran. Otherwise, for every other deed that we do, the sharia has not come with verbalizing the intentions. And therefore, it is best to avoid doing this. There is no need to verbalize. Allah knows what is in your heart, right? Allah is the one who is alimul ghaybi wa shahada. And so, I know some of our scholars and some of the madhabs, they want you to verbalize and they think that by verbalizing, you are purifying your intentions and you're focused on what you're trying to do. I understand that philosophy. So they say, when you stand up to pray, say, oh Allah, this is two rak'ah for tahiyyatul masjid, you know, that's sunnah, that's for your sake. Oh Allah, this is four rak'ah, salat al-dhuhr, you know. So you are focusing on the intention. I understand where they're coming from. But of course, the, the, the um, flip side is that you don't need to verbalize to focus on the intention. Allah knows your intention. You are standing up to pray dhuhr or two rak'ah, tahiyyatul masjid, whatever it might be. So there is no need to verbalize the intention for any deed. Allah knows your intention. Yes, you must have the intention, but there's no need to verbalize it. Our brother then says that there's so many different types of words mentioned in the Quran. And in reality, uh, you know, fidya, uh, and kafara and others, these are technical terms that you only need to do when you have done a particular you know, penalty. So fidya, for example, uh, that uh, if you are in the state of ihram and you break one of the rulings of ihram, you pay the fidya. So the fidya, for example, it's not done any day of the week. It's done as 
a penalty. The same goes for kafara, that kafara is only done to make up a penalty. For example, uh, if you make a, a qasam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then for whatever reason you have to break the qasam, then you will pay a kafara. So fidya and kafara are both technical charities technical sadaqahs that you only have to give if you have done something that that uh, necessitates it. Otherwise, these are terms that the average person every day does not need to, to do. Uh, the term, our brother says also sadaqah and zakah. And in, the, in this case, the term sadaqah and zakah, this is one of those terms that really confuses a lot of people. Let me put it to you this way, very simplistically. Sadaqah and zakah, imagine you have two Venn diagrams, okay? So what you have is that there is an overlap between these two Venn diagrams, and there's an area where sadaqah and zakah are the same. And then there is an area where zakat is separate and sadaqah is separate, okay? So two Venn diagrams and they're overlapping. And in the middle, sometimes when you use the term sadaqah, you mean zakah. And when you use zakah, you mean sadaqah. And there are other times when the term zakat takes on another meaning and sadaqah takes on a unique meaning. So what does all of this mean? The Quran, the Quran uses the term zakat and sadaqah to imply charity for the sake of Allah. So for example, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ So in Surah At-Tawbah, Allah says sadaqah is for eight categories of people. And Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ Those that are constantly giving, you know, zakat. In both of these verses, Allah Azza wa Jal is using terms, zakat and sadaqah. And in reality, each one of them is apply, implying the opposite that most people understand from these terms. And they get confused because when you read the books of fiqh, they will say zakat is the obligatory 2.5% and sadaqah is the voluntary. And this is correct sometimes. Sometimes the Quran uses the term zakat and it means sadaqah. Like for example, they're constantly giving charity, any type of charity. And in Surah At-Tawbah, Allah says, Allah, Allah says that sadaqah is for eight categories and he means zakat is for eight categories, okay? So bottom line, the term zakat can mean technically that which is obligatory, but it can also mean all types of charity. And the term sadaqah technically can mean that which is not obligatory, but it can also mean that which is obligatory, okay? How do you know all of this? How do you know? By context. You go to the scholars, you go to the books of tafsir, and then you see, uh, you know, wh when is zakat and when is sadaqah being used under which term. And in reality, the context is very, very clear. Nobody gets confused in terms of the uh, the language of the Quran and Sunnah. So just keep this point in mind. Our brother is asking, what is the different types? So now you understand, fidya and kafara or technical types of charity that you must give as a penalty to make up something that you have done. And sadaqah and zakah, as I explained, that there are technical definitions and then there's linguistic. And technically, zakat is the obligatory amount you have to give once a year, 2.5% uh, uh, on the uh, amount that you have above the nisab. And sadaqah is anything that is you know above that amount. And yet the Quran uses both of these two terms for each other. Our brother also says, what form of charity is the most beneficial? And then he gives examples, giving money or giving food or helping others out. And the response is that the most beneficial form of charity is that which is going to help the person the most. Overall, the most beneficial charity is that which will benefit the person in front of you the most. So for some people, Giving food is the best charity. For others, giving money is the best charity. For others, giving of your time, of your effort, of your, you know, somebody needs a ride, somebody needs your, your car, and you say, khalas, I'll take you, no problem, okay? For some people, smiling, our Prophet said, smiling is charity, time is charity. As he said in one hadith, pouring your bucket of water into your neighbor's bucket is an act of charity. So there is no one charity that is, everything is underneath it. No, the charity that is the most beloved to Allah 
is the charity that is the most beneficial. And this varies from circumstance to circumstance and the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu and the actions of the righteous before us were to diversify one's charity. And this is something that unfortunately not many of us think about. When we think of charity, we think of writing a check and that is it. And in reality, that is but one form of charity. There is charity that is beyond this charity of your effort, physically doing something for somebody else, right? Literally standing up and going somewhere and helping somebody out. There's charity of your physical strength. There's charity of your status, can you believe? So if you are a person, you know, of fame, of respect, and you know, you have connections and somebody needs halal help, no problem. It's nothing, you know, you're not doing a bribe or something, halal help. Our Prophet ﷺ encouraged this. The Quran encourages it. وَمَنْ يَشْفَعْ شَفَاعَةً حَسَنًا Whoever does a good shafa'ah. And a good shafa'ah means you use your connection for something that is legit. We're not talking about using them for illegitimate, for a good connection. Somebody needs a job. And you know you know this brother is qualified. And you know the CEO of the company, okay? And you call him and say, you know, I know this brother. He is a trustworthy brother, right? And I know him and I encourage you to, to look at his resume. This is a shafa'ah. This can be charity and subhanallah if you help this brother you know get on his feet and get a halal job and he helps his parents and he gets married this is the best you can he doesn't want your, your check this brother he wants that connection that you might have that he does not have right so my point being that uh, there are different types of charity and so you need to look at what is going to be the maximum benefit and then do that and also realize as well that yes it is true that certain types of charities um, you know there are certain hadith about them and so try to diversify, don't just do one thing. For example, uh, our Prophet Sallallahu in particular, he encouraged uh, the helping of the orphans, right? And in particular, he said that uh, uh, when a man came to him and said, O Messenger of Allah, my heart becomes hard. So our Prophet Sallallahu said, go and feed a hungry person and wipe the uh, hair of the, or the head of the orphan, means hug the orphan, love is charity, dear brothers and sisters, love. So loving an orphan, okay? Showing that orphan, you know, the orphan does not have a father figure and you become a part of that person's life and you are there. So look at what he said, give food to the hungry and wipe the head of that child. Why? Because that yatim, what he's missing the most is the love of a father. And so if you step in and you take on a fatherly figure, that is charity. You're spending your time and your love and you're showing your dedication. So diversify. You're just like, you know, the, the uh, income, uh, you know, analysts, the, uh, the wealth generators, they tell us to diversify our investments, right? Invest in this stock and invest in mutual funds and invest in real estate and invest in this and that. They say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So we as well, when we invest for the sake of Allah, we don't want to invest in only one. We diversify because we do not know which dua of which brother will be the most beneficial for us. We want to do as much as possible. And we build, for example, one of the best charities is to uh, build water wells, right? This is something that was very common in the Muslim Ummah. Throughout our history, one of the most uh, significant charities that was always done is to have a public water source because everybody will benefit and they will thank you for it. Just have a, you know, in those days they didn't have running water. So people would have a well, they would dig it and then they would just leave it there and say, Waqf. Anybody can drink from it. So much so our Prophet even said that if a bird or an animal drinks from that water, you will get your, the reward for it. So these are things that we should uh, think about, uh, diversifying our charity, making the maximum amount of benefit and also for the longest time. So you're saying which charity is the best? I said that which is the maximum benefit. And also that which goes beyond one instance in time. So the longest impact to the greatest amount of people. That's what you should be thinking about. And so having a charity that is perpetual, it's called a waqf, is better than a one-off charity. And a simple example is, as I explained, building a well or constructing something that people can benefit from for longer generations, for multiple times. And that's going to be considered a, uh, a charity. Uh, so that was the question about uh, which form of charity is the most uh, beneficial. Now our brother says as well that 
what can we do to derive the most benefit from our charity? And SubhanAllah, that's a very deep question. And I must say that, you know, I don't recall anybody's asking that question to me anytime before. And mashallah, this is a brother from Myanmar emailing, mashallah, tabarakallah. And he is saying that, okay, we're giving that money or whatever, but I wanna have, you know, as we say in here in America, the most bang for my buck. I wanna have the best barakah in my charity. And I say to this brother, you know, you've already, you've already begun that journey by this question. The very fact that you are asking from the depths of your heart and you want the charity that you give to have the maximum impact, inshallah, that is the beginning. Because innaman amalu bin niyat, that actions are judged by intentions. Don't look at the quantity of what you're giving. Look at the quality of when you give it. And we have over here the beautiful example in Sahih Bukhari of the lady of ill rep repute, right? Of a lady who, whose lifestyle was to seduce other men for the sake of money. And that lady, we don't know her circumstance, but it is clear that, you know, she had very difficult circumstances. And so she was doing what she was doing. This is not to justify, but it is clear that Allah forgave her for something which indicates that she has a positive side as well. What did Allah forgive her for? We all know the hadith. She was charitable to a thirsty dog in the summer day. She was thirsty herself and she's looking for water and she sees a well and the daughter, the, 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 the dog is outside of the well panting because it doesn't have access to the water. And so she goes into the well, she drinks herself, and then she takes her shoe and she gives some water to that dog. And the dog is also a creature, like we are creatures. And the dog needs water like we need water. And she had in her heart ikhlas that only Allah knows. Subhanallah, look, this was a lady of bad character, who is feeding water to the dog. Don't look at the charity. Don't look at the quantity. Don't look at the one doing. Don't look at the one whom it is done to, a lady of ill repute, doing this water, giving this water to the dog. Don't look only at one thing, the quality of the heart. Subhanallah, all of these factors of the story became irrelevant. And what mattered? was the quality of what she was doing in her heart. And Allah forgave her her whole life since because of that one act of charity. So you have already begun this step when you ask, how can I maximize it? By your intentions, number one. Number two, another thing that maximizes it is to be consistent in your charities. To be consistent. Allah says in the Quran, talking about the people of Firdaus, talking about the highest level of Jannah, those that are constantly giving charity, okay? So do not just give one off every few months, try your best to do small acts of charity continuously throughout the year, if not daily. And remember, charity doesn't have to be money. It can be good attitude, smiling face. It can be a good word. It can be helping hand. So consistency in doing small actions. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, the most beloved of all deeds to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is that which is consistent, even if it is small. So that's the second way to increase the maximum benefit of charity is to keep on being charitable as a lifestyle constantly. And whoever is charitable by heart, will find ways to show that charity in the daily life. And then the third thing that we can say about maximizing the benefit of charity is to give charity in secret. To give charity in secret. Our Prophet Sallallahu talked about the seven people who will be sheltered on the Day of Judgment. And one of them is a man who gives so secretly that his left hand does not even know what his right hand is giving. And the meaning here, don't advertise your charity. It's not wrong to tell other people, but try your best to have a lot of secret charities. Not even your spouse, not even your parents. Quietly give. In fact, try to give so that the one you're giving charity to does not even know who you are. Go to that level. So these are the three things that I advise you 
if you want to maximize your charity. First and foremost, your ikhlas in your heart. Secondly, consistency. And thirdly, secrecy. And the final question that you had is, is it okay to intend something of this world or will that diminish the reward? And the response is that it will not diminish the reward if you give charity in order to gain, gain something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. It's not going to diminish the reward. Why is that? Because the very fact that you are linking a good to Allah and you are saying that, oh Allah, I'm giving you know this money. Oh Allah, I ask that you, that you protect me. Oh Allah, I'm giving this charity. Oh Allah, cure my son. Oh Allah, I'm giving this charity. Give me more in this world and the next world. As long as you are linking it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not going to diminish because dear brother in Islam, you have to realize one thing, you are not dealing with a created entity that is going to be stingy and miserly. You are dealing with the Khaliq, with the Rabb, with the Rabbul Arsh. You are dealing with the Kareem. Allah is Al Kareem, and Allah is Al Mannan, and Allah is Al Razzaq. And Allah gives and gives and gives, and Allah does not count. So, do not presume, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, that there is any stinginess. There is no stinginess. Allah is not stingy. Allah is the most generous. And Allah loves generosity. So, when you give, expect the rewards of this world and expect the rewards of the next. How do we know this? Because, dear brother in Islam, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam literally linked charity with so many blessings of this world. We can go on and on. There's many lectures about this and every fundraiser that we attend here in the Western world, we know these, you know, from, 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 the, uh, from our memory, we know them, right? Our Prophet ﷺ said, give charity to cure your own sick relatives. Dawa mardakum sadaqat. So if your child is sick, we are encouraged to give charity for your child. Our Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, when we uh, give charity, you know, we will get back more. This is in the Quran even, right? We will get back more in this world, you know, uh, 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 before the next world. Our Prophet ﷺ swore by Allah that when we give charity, our money will not decrease, it will rather increase. So why did he link all of these worldly blessings with charity? He never once said, by the way, he never once said, you know, if you want, you'll get your reward in the, in the hereafter. And if you want, your son will be cured because of charity. He didn't make the either or. He explicitly linked the giving of charity with blessings of this world. As does the Quran, by the way, right? Allah Azza wa says in the Quran that Allah blesses sadaqah. Allah Azza wa mentions in the Quran, who will give unto me a beautiful loan and I shall return it multiple. Allah will give it back much, much, much more. Why is Allah telling you that He's going to give it back much more? Because see, here's the point, dear brother in Islam. How can it be evil or negative to want this world from Allah when you give charity for the sake of Allah? Because you are demonstrating your Iman in Allah. When you say that, Oh Allah, here is my wealth to that poor person. Oh Allah, give me back more wealth. You are demonstrating you believe in the promise of Allah. In fact, and let me finish off with this point. I know time is almost up here. The term sadaqah in the Quran, it literally means the proof of your belief. That's literally the meaning of sadaqah. So, we all know the term Sadaqa Allahu Azim. We all know Abu Bakr al Siddiq. Sadaqa means to believe. Sadaqa Allah, Allah has spoken the truth. And the term Sadaqa with a tamar buta, which implies the charity that we give, the term Sadaqa comes from that same root to believe. Why is the term for giving our wealth linked for the same term to believe? Here's the point. When you give money, expecting Allah to give you back more and to help you in this world and to protect you and to lift his anger from you and to bless your wealth and to cure your sick. You are showing Allah through your money that, oh Allah, I believe in your promise. 
I believe, I don't have any proof, I, don't, I cannot see it, but I believe when I give a thousand dollars, I will get back much more in this world and the next world. And so literally, as we say in English, you know, put your money where your mouth is, we say this, that's what sadaqah does. You put your money where your iman is. How can it be evil? How can it be negative? How can it be diminishing of your reward when you are telling Allah through your actions that, oh Allah, everything that you mentioned about charity, I believe in it and here's my money. So there is nothing wrong. In fact, this is the essence of Islam and Iman. In fact, this is why we have been encouraged, motivated, incentivized to give charity for the blessings of this world because in order to get those blessings, we have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, dear brother in Islam, give and give charity and keep on giving and give for the sake of Allah and give sincerely and give continuously and give secretly and give all types of charity and expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you with every blessing of this world and every blessing of the next world. And with that, inshallah, we come to the conclusion of today's q and I'll see you next week. Until then, jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما ان الذين يؤذون الله ورسوله لعنهم الله في الدنيا والاخره واعد لهم عذابا مهينا والذين يؤذون المؤمنين والمؤمنات بغير ما اكتسبوا فقد احتملوا بهتانا وإثما مبينا